Welcome to the Everything Building Envelope podcast. On this show, we discuss topics relating to the exterior building envelope, such as waterproofing, glazing, cladding, roofing, and more. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. For previous episodes, show notes, and bonus video content, check out our website, everythingbuildingenvelope.com. Now, here's your host for the Everything Building Envelope podcast, Paul Beers. Welcome, everyone, to our Everything Building Envelope podcast. This is Paul Beers, CEO and Managing Member for GCI Consultants, and I will be your host today. I'm really excited to have as our guest today, Karen Schiffmiller, the president of FAPIA, the Florida Association of Public Insurance Adjusters. Karen, welcome. Thank you, Paul. I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here too. You know, we tried to schedule, we're scheduling this, it's right before hurricane season starts. And um, I know we tried to do this about a month ago and you were busy up in Tallahassee with the Florida legislature and the, the yearly fun and games that go on up there. So I'm glad we were yeah. able to um, push it back a little bit and i um, really excited about having a nice um, chat about things today. I am as well, so, thank um, you. Great. So before we get started, you maybe you want to tell the, our audience a little bit about yourself and then we can um, start talking about FAPIA and insurance claims and things like that. Sure, I would love to. Um, I originally moved to Florida uh, from New York in 1994. Um, I was a paralegal for a long time, uh, my whole career, and uh, I decided my love of helping people is what made me switch gears and change my career to becoming a public insurance adjuster. So um, I'm also an insurance appraiser and an umpire, and I've been for over 15 years, and it's just my passion. I, I just love helping people. It's what I do. I've been that way since I was a child. So here we are. <laughs> Great. It's always fun to be of service as opposed to um, just grinding it out every day. Yes, yes, absolutely. So tell us about FAPIA. So FAPIA um, is the largest public adjusting association in the country. We have almost 800 members. And we offer our members such amazing educational opportunities. Um, you know, we have such interesting topics. Our speakers are always well informed. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you have attended, not only attended, but you, you've, you know, spoken at our conferences and, and presented. So, um, you I know, have, we always and have. I really, yeah, it's, it's great to get in front of the, you know, the adjusters and all the other folks in the industry and kind of let them know what, what we've been up to. So they, FAPIA does a really good job with, with the um, educational programs, which lately have been virtual and before that, you know, were in person. Well, yes, unfortunately, because of COVID, we, we had to cancel our conferences last year and, and we usually customarily have uh, two conferences a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And again, due to COVID, we had to cancel, but what was really exciting for us we were able to launch our first ever virtual conference back in December, and it was really well received. It was a, a kind of like almost a live virtual event. It was the most amazing event because I had attended other virtual events that did not compare to what Sapia put on in December. Um, that was an, that was an amazing event, and. Um, you know, you do what you have to do with what you have to work with. So we were doing it virtually and it was really fun. We also launched our PA Academy for our members, which um, allowed our members to also, that couldn't partake in the December virtual conference to still get their CEs and keep up with their um, requirements with CSS. So we were able to do that. And um, it, it's just, we're going to continue on with PA Academy as well, um, but we're still going to get back to our in-person conference uh, this October, and we're really looking forward and excited to be back in October and see everybody, and we'll be launching registration very soon for that, so we'll keep everybody no, informed. Great. Yeah. I want to give a shout out to the executive director, Nancy Dominguez. She put this, um, or, or was I know was instrumental in the virtual conference, and yeah. I was a, I was a speaker, so I got to you know do the rehearsal, see behind the curtain a little bit, and mm -hmm. um, I thought it was really fabulous too. And, and, and her her passion and excitement and the way she put it all together, I thought was was really really good. And um, 
as you say, these virtual conferences can be horribly boring. Um, yeah. <laughs> or maybe not, but, but this one, this one was, was really done well and it had, um, you know, like, uh, um, exhibit hall and all these lounges and rooms and everything. And it was, it was very slick and, and very well done and a good reflection on FAPIA. Oh, thank you. We really, really put our heart and soul into that. And I have to, you know, say Nancy is phenomenal. There, that, that goes without saying. Uh, Nancy is, is amazing. And um, her whole team, I mean, our IT director, all, everybody involved, it was a collaborative effort. And, and it really, really turned out well. So FAPIA, people don't really realize what goes on behind the scenes at FAPIA. And that you got to see a little glimpse of it. So I'm glad you got to see that and be part of it. Yeah, that. Do, doing doing something that well doesn't happen by accident. It's, it's no, no. Months and, of preparation. And and, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So how did you become involved with FAPIA? Well, I became a member back in 2007 for all the reasons that I mentioned, the great educational opportunities, all of the benefits. You know, we have an amazing form library for our members. You know, knowing I can make a difference, well, I'm the kind of person I always feel that I have to, I'm, I'm always there to help people and I always want to, you know, do better for our industry. So I had joined the board back in 2014. I think many people know, aside from me being the current president, I also chair um, the Community Affairs Committee, which is an amazing committee. And it's all about paying it forward and giving back and helping those less fortunate. So it's just been part of my nature and, and part of why I joined such a great organization. It's really, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying that because I'm the president. I have been a member and joined the board and have become their president, but I've been involved for many, many, many years. And it's really a phenomenal organization. And, and I highly recommend that if you're not a public adjuster, um, that you're not a member of FAPIA, that you definitely go to fapia.net, F-A-P-I-A.net, and join. And, re and look at our website and see all the amazing you know, work that FAPIA does for the industry, for consumers, and for all of our members. So obviously, um, public adjusters are members of FAPIA. Are there, are there other membership classifications? Well, there's associate members as well, which are associate members or attorneys. Um, so we have associate members, and that the primary uh, membership is, is our public adjusters. But we do have some associate members as well, and I'd like to give a big shout out to them because they're very instrumental as well as our sponsors in providing the great educational opportunities that we provide. And, you know, if it weren't for all of them, you know, uh, partaking and, and sponsoring and being so involved, um, they're a big, big part of the FAPIA success as well. So for public adjusters, are there, are there any special requirements to join FAPIA? Uh, well, our bylaws require that all of our members are in, you know, in compliance with regulatory requirements, um, including their licensure, their appointment. They have to be in good standing with DFS. So there is, you know, a, through our membership committee, we really review applicants and we, you know, go through a vetting process to make sure, and that includes our, you know, associate members as well. You go through a vetting process to make sure that they meet all the criteria to become a member. And what about people that um, are trying to get into the industry, like, like um, apprentices and whatnot? Can they join FAPIA? Absolutely. We encourage all apprentices to join FAPI, especially for the training program. Um, you know, we developed this training program specifically for apprentices and newer public adjusters, and it's available in our webinar library, along with some other amazing resource materials like form letters and, you know, stuff to help them in the industry. So we, we encourage them you know, to get involved and to learn the right way. That's, that's, Tappy is very big about, the, you know, educating the industry and, and doing everything right. And we have such a strict ethical protocol as well. So I highly recommend it. Yes. So if one of our listeners was, was interested in this career path, shall we call it, to, to, to be a public adjuster, what would one have to do to eventually become a public adjuster? Well, you do have to go through an apprenticeship first. So you would have to apply through uh, the Department of Financial Services, and you would have to go through an apprenticeship, which is a, a six-month apprenticeship, and um, have your, you know, 
be trained and, and under another public adjuster. And then SAPI is very big about connecting people together. So a lot of times we'll have apprentices uh, call looking to do an apprenticeship and we try to put them in touch with public adjusters in their area and certain public adjusting firms to facilitate that as well. Great. You, you mentioned the uh, committee that you were on before you were, um, when you first started getting more involved with that and um, mm -hmm. before you became the president. So can, can you sort of talk about the committee work that members volunteer to perform? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so important for a member to join a committee because if they ever have future endeavors to get on the board, you have to fulfill a commitment to serve on a committee for a certain amount of years. So it's, I encourage, you know, our members to actively get involved with committees because they do make a difference. We, we have the Community Affairs Committee, which again is all about paying it forward and giving back. Our Public Relations Committee, our Membership Committee, uh, Ethics Committee. We have an Unlicensed Activity Fraud Committee. I mean, there's so many more committees to get involved with and we, we really ask our members, you know, to volunteer and, and make a difference. I mean, that, that's why I joined FAPIA and that I've always been on a committee and I slowly, I, I, when I joined FAPIA, I never intended to get on the board, but I realized I can make more of a difference. So I did, and here I am <laughs> as the president, but I, I definitely encourage everybody to get involved in a committee. It, you really can make a difference. So you got the president job right through COVID too. Huh? Yeah, I was so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's like I said, it is what it is. You know, you work around, do what you have to do. Yeah. And so while well, COVID rages on, uh, raged on, hopefully we're on the, on the way out of it now, the, um, there were still hurricanes. Uh, the yeah. Florida legislature was still doing their thing. So um, messed up your meetings. Yeah. Did I miss anything? I'm sorry? I said, did I miss anything? So you're, no, you're challenging, I, no. Your challenging term. It, it it was a very challenging term because I came into my presidency toward the end of last year, and that's when I started my presidency, and it goes for a one-year term. So I'm president through the end of October, and we were battling with this, you know, again decisions and and having to have that first ever virtual, you know, conference. We were just about entering legislative session, which was very contentious this year, and uh, it was a busy, busy year. And you know, it it was it was a challenge, but we we prevailed. You know, we we have an amazing legislative committee. I chair that as the president, and we were hands on throughout the entire legislative session. We have an amazing lobby team. So I couldn't thank them enough for all the work they do. Our ambassadors, our ambassador committee. Um, the, our ambassadors took the time to meet with their local legislators and form relationships and inform them um, and, and make a difference, you know, with all of their local representatives. So that's a, that's a big key. That's a very important committee as well. You know, throughout session, it was difficult, but we kept our members up to date every step of the way. When we asked our members to step up to our calls to action for advocacy and outreach, they absolutely stepped up every time we asked. Was that effective? And it was very effective. Very, very effective. I cannot tell you the amount that, that we had an amazing response from, from our membership. And when we asked them to reach out and, and step up, they did. You know, FAPIA is, is very big about keeping up to date with the pulse of the insurance industry to make sure that consumers, our members, and the industry as a whole are protective from overreaching regulations. So we made a very, very big attempt to keep every, follow every bill, um, you know, in real time. And we, we, it was, you know, when I said it, it was a busy legislative session, it was because bills were changing, literally things change minute to minute. And you can look at something one minute and then 10 minutes later, it's changed, <laughs> you know, so we were very effective and our members, you know, were as well. So I heard you say consumers. So FAPIA obviously, you know, has a membership of public adjusters, but, but they obviously are, um, their clients are the, uh, the policy holders. And um, so how does the work that FAPIA does benefit the policy holders? 
Well, you know, we get, we, we get calls constantly. Um, Fapia does, you know, we get calls from, from consumers looking for help all the time, looking for a public adjuster in their area, trying to understand, you know, about a public adjuster. Um, interestingly enough, we, we get some complaints from consumers but the complaints are never, they think it's about a public adjuster because they think they've hired a public adjuster, but it turned out these people were never licensed public adjusters and they were, they were you know, unlicensed uh, individuals pretending to be public adjusters. So, you know, um, we were able to try to help and assist those consumers that, you know, were not happy and that were uh, not being treated very well with, with individuals that were unlicensed. So we were able to really assist them as well. So I, I did a, um, a podcast recording with Chip Merlin, who's an attorney. I know one of your sponsors. And yeah. He had just written yeah. a book about insurance, you know, insurance claims and insurance companies and whatnot. And one of the things mm-hmm. he said in the book loud and clear is that, you know, if you've got a, um, a, a claim, an insurance claim, property insurance claim of any magnitude, you really need to hire a um, public adjuster to help you and make sure that you don't miss anything, meet all the complex requirements of the insurance policies. And I've tried to read my homeowner's policy and it's like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. and um, so, so it, was, it was really insightful to hear him, you know, really promote the, um, the public adjusters as the starting point for claims and, and yeah. basically made the point that, you know, attorneys can come in later if necessary. Hopefully it's not necessary. Right. And sometimes it is. And Chip is, is, yes, he is, you know, one of our sponsors, but he's a big advocate for, for public adjusters as well. And, and, you know, um, he was up in Tallahassee with us too. And, and I thank him for everything he does for the industry because he is a true consumer advocate as well. Um, but you're right. It, it, you, you have to, you know, hire the right public adjuster and you have to make sure that they, you know, they're, they're qualified and to assist you. Every claim is different. No claim is alike. That's right. So this was the 2021, just in case somebody's listening to this podcast three years from now, <laughs> this was the 2021 <laughs> legislative session that we're, we're talking about. Can you kind of maybe give us a synopsis of what was going on and how things ended up? What happened during legislative session, the initial bills that, and again, there were many bills that were filed, but the there were some initial bills that were filed that would have really harmed consumer, uh, not so much commercial policyholders as much as residential. And the residential policyholders, they were trying to put some roof depreciation schedule into that bill. Um, and if you owned your home, like, and, and your roof, let's say, is you know, 25 years old, you have a, a tile roof, 25-year-old you know, tile roof, and no issues, it's in good condition. Um, the insurance companies wanted to put a roof depreciation schedule, thereby if you had a, a hurricane came through and you had a claim, they wouldn't be responsible for replacing the entire roof. They would be able to depreciate it by the age of the roof. And that isn't good for consumers. Um, you know, unfortunately, we were able to get that language removed from the bill. But regardless, you know, things like that happen during legislative session that uh, they stick some things in there, it, it, then it gets removed, it gets put back in, it gets removed. Thankfully, we were able to get you know that removed, and uh, that's where the protection of consumers come into play because a lot of times, if you have a claim, you, you know, Paul, being in this industry, it can take sometimes years to get remedied and to get a proper settlement of a claim depending on the complexity of the claim. So there was some other legislation they were trying to put some statute of limitations as to when you had to file the claim by, you know, and lessen it from three years to two years. And, you know, um, it, it was it was pretty difficult session. But I think in the long run, it turned out very, very well. And, and consumers are still protected. And even though you may have two years to file a claim, you can still, if you're in the, in the repair process, that has been extended a little bit longer for, for a supplemental claim. So therefore, if you're going through repairs and there's additional damage that's found, you have uh, three years to be able, from the data loss, to be able to you know, file for those additional damage. So you know, there were some good things, that, a lot of good things that came out of it as well. That's great. Yeah, the roof thing, if you um, if you only get paid for part of the roof and you need the whole roof, I mean, the whole point of insurance, I thought, was to you know, keep you from having to come out of pocket beyond your deductible right. for 
for legitimate things. And, and so what's, what's the point of having insurance if, if it's not covered fully? Right, right. And, you know, listen, there's a lot of things, you know, in the, in the, the insurance industry is, uh, you know, uh, there's some carriers that uh, are pulling out, you know, don't want to write insurance in Florida or pulling out of certain areas in Florida and no longer writing policies, um, you know, uh, and hopefully the new legislation that has come forth will be able to turn that around and, uh, you know, keep, keep the good carriers where they need to be and <laughs> writing insurance in Florida. <laughs> yeah, no, so I, you know, so I've, I've been around a long time starting yeah. with Hurricane Andrew in 1992 and everybody left after that. And, you know, I think citizens had virtually all the policies residential for, you know, a while or a large amount of them. And, you know, then free enterprise, you know, companies started coming back in again. So you always hear everybody's going to leave, but it doesn't seem like that actually happens. <laughs> so. Well, let's hope that the changes that um, are taking place will, you know, have a good good impact for the industry. And, and, and let's hope that that changes and insurance rates don't continue to rise and they can come down and we can pay more realistic insurance rates because there are people that, that you know, uh, somebody let's let's for instance an elderly person that that can't afford to replace their roof or can't afford to to make certain repairs to their home or pay their insurance. So you, you know they're on a fixed income. So we're hoping that the the industry repairs you know, gets repaired sooner rather than later. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about insurance claims. I mean, hopefully there won't be a lot of activity this year. We certainly had plenty of it last year. It's kind of crazy, in fact. So. Yeah. We're due for maybe a little bit of a slowdown this year, although um, that's not what's being predicted. But prediction and reality, you know, may not be may not be one and the same. Right. So, um, right. so with, with with your membership and um, I mean your membership being public adjusters and claims and whatnot, what can can FAPIA do, or what what what, what, what kind of advice would you give them around um, putting together insurance claims? I'm really, really big, and I, I probably scream this from the rooftops. Um, you know, when a client calls us, so when a client is reaching out, my advice to an apprentice, to a new public adjuster, to old time, any public adjuster, you know, when a client is reaching out for our help, they're vulnerable, they're overwhelmed, they're, they need help for a reason. You always, always, always have to do the right thing and put your clients first. That is first and foremost, and that's what my business partner and I do in our firm. We make our clients our priority. They must be. You have to keep them well informed. You have to keep them up to date. If there's no change in the status of their claim, tell them anyway. Give them a status. Keep them informed and always return their phone calls and answer when they need you. Good communication. That works in everything, I think. Yes, it's key. It's key. You don't want your client upset with you that you haven't returned a phone call or, you know, given them an update. Get ahead of it. Don't have them make that phone call to you. Give them an update on a weekly basis. So as you're you're working, helping someone with a claim, what do they do and what do you do? And, you know, and how does it, you know, putting all the, the, I guess, the documentation together, how does that work? So, you know, documenting your file is key. You can't ever assume that your potential client never had a claim before. So you have to make sure you ask a lot of questions. Ask them if they've ever had a claim. If they have, review the document, the documentation for their prior claims. If they've had a prior claim, make sure it didn't affect the area in which you're going to discuss with them at that time. Um, Make sure if they have done repairs that they have receipts for those repairs because a lot of times the insurance company wants, they they have records of prior claims. Very important to review the insurance policy. Read it again and again and again and understand the entire policy. Highlight things because in one section of the policy, there will be something that's covered and then there will be an endorsement added into the policy that removes the coverage or changes the coverage. So you need to read your policy in its entirety, understand it, highlight, read it again and again, and make sure you understand that policy. Documenting the file. Go ahead. No, you finished. 
documenting your file, make sure you have detailed photos, notes, videos if necessary. Infrared, we have an infrared camera. We have a Matterport 3D camera. We have a, a drone. That doesn't mean having a drone doesn't mean we don't get up on roofs. You have to document your file well, and you have to back up everything that's in your estimate. So when the insurance, when you're asking the insurance company to pay X amount of dollars, you need to show the support and back up to what you're asking for. A well-documented file is always key to a successful claim resolution. I'll throw in one more thing just from my experience. It's good to have good documentation about the condition of the property before a loss. So like, you know, that would be a good thing to do as hurricane season starts, just go around, take pictures of everything, you know, show your roof's intact and doesn't have a bunch of cracked tiles or, or shingles missing. And, you know, take pictures of each room and windows and doors and exterior walls and anything you can get. Because when I come in as an expert at the end of the, you know, after after a loss, how do I know what the condition was like before the storm? I don't. So I've got to, you know, do detective work to try and figure it out. And it makes it much, 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 much easier when a client has good documentation. Oh, and also any maintenance records, caulking, painting, you know, you mentioned this, repairs, things like that. Keep everything and um, really helps a lot. I I agree with you. And and my business partner and I, we do pre-loss property inspections. We offer that um, as well, where you heard all the equipment that we have in our little arsenal of tools, but we um, actually go out and do a lot of pre lost property inspections where we're documenting the exterior, the roof, like you said, the windows, the doors, the interior, um, the contents where, you know, we're, we're documenting all that for, you know, um, just in case, because as you know, like you said, you don't know the condition before you were hired as an expert to come in and inspect it. So it is important. And that's a good tool that we provide people so that, they can have that and say, look, this is the condition of our property before this happened. That damage wasn't there. Here, here's the video or here, here are the photos. You know, so it's, it's important. And I agree with you 100%. Yeah, well, the, pre, the pre-loss the um, pre surveys are really, it's a great idea because that could make, make such a difference. Really smart to do that. And be, if someone has the opportunity, so that's a really great service. How uh, how could somebody get in touch with you if, if they want to, um, they need your service? Around so for, I mean, we're, like I said, we're not just public adjusters. We're also insurance agents and umpires, and we offer those pre-loss property inspections um, and the you know, documenting the condition, not just to residential property owners, but to commercial property owners as well. Um, and you can call us. We're Reliant Insurance Adjusters. You can reach us by phone at 561-288. 6434, or you can visit our website at reliantpa.com. That's R E L I A N T P A.com. Great. You reminded me of a wonder question I wanted to ask you. Sure. Okay, which I, right in the very beginning, when you, when you said you were a, um, an adjuster, an umpire, and an appraiser. <laughs> can, you, can you tell the listeners what the difference is between those three roles? Yes. So a public adjuster is a, is a claims advocate. Um, we represent policyholders against their insurance companies when they have insurance cr- claims for residential or property, uh, commercial property owners. An appraiser is a public adjuster has to be licensed and appointed. As an appraiser, although I am licensed as a public adjuster, um, I'm not acting as a public adjuster. I'm coming in when there's a dispute as to the amount of the loss, sometimes the the scope items involved in the repair process. So um, a policyholder would appoint me as their appraiser to advocate, not so much advocate, but to come in as a neutral party and look at their damages, look at potentially either their public adjuster's estimate and to come to some kind of an agreement with the insurance company's appraiser to come up with the value of the claim and what is owed on the claim. As an umpire, you're called in when the two appraisers 
the appraiser for the insurance company and the appraiser for the policyholder do not come to an agreement, they would then call the umpire in to make a final determination on the claim. So there's lots of inspections that take place and it can you know, sometimes it gets resolved between both of the appraisers, sometimes it doesn't, and you have to call the umpire in. So um, we work in each capacity. We're public adjusters, and we're appraisers, and we're umpires. And, um, you know, we pride ourselves on our on our fairness and our honesty and integrity, and, and we have a very good reputation in the industry. We've been, we've been doing this for over 15 years. Great. Yeah, it's, it's um, there's a lot of complexities, right, from... <laughs> the moment the event hits until, you know, the, the claims finally, finally resolved. Unfortunately, it's not easy. So it's great to have people that can help policyholders along the way. Right. 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 Yeah. So um, really interesting, really interesting discussion. And um, I actually learned a few things and I'm sure the listeners did as well. And, um, you know, FAPIA, I, I've always had a, a good respect for as a, as a organization that really tries to do the right thing and, and for, the, for the good of the industry and for, uh, for consumers. So thank you yeah. so much for um, being a guest today on the Everything Building Envelope podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was truly a pleasure and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Yes, well, I think we're both going to the wind conf- Windstorm Conference next week. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so we'll connect um, then and we'll catch up a little bit more. I'd love to. Yeah. One one other thing. How how can our audience contact FAPIA if they um if they're in need? Um they can reach our managing director, Nancy Dominguez, at eight six six two three five six four eight nine. And you can also visit FAPIA dot net, F A P I A dot net. And we have a, a lot of information on our website that uh can assist um, our members as well as a future member. And if they have any questions, we're a great resource for our public adjusters and the consumers in our industry. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Karen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate So I'd like to thank everyone for listening to our podcast today. And I invite you, if you have to take a further look at GCI Consultant Services, if you're in need of help with exterior Uh, building envelope, windows, doors, roofs, and things of that sort at our website, www.gciconsultants.com. And this is Paul Beers saying so long till next time. Thanks for joining us today. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. For more information on the Everything Building Envelope, previous episodes, show notes, bonus video content, and much more, check out our website, everythingbuildingenvelope.com.